SpaceX's next-generation Starship launch vehicle, the most powerful rocket ever built, put on quite a show during its second integrated flight test. Let's take a look at the major events that happened last week that led to the launch of the world's most powerful rocket. On November 11, Starship 25 was de-stacked from Booster 9 to fix the tiles that fell from the ship after it was fully stacked on November 10. Workers replaced the damaged tiles with the new ones the following days, while SpaceX awaited the launch license for the second integrated flight test from the FAA. On November 14, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service submitted the final biological report to the FAA after completing an environmental review of the Starbase launch site, including an investigation into the environmental effects of the newly installed water deluge system designed to protect the launch pad infrastructure from heat and vibration during engine ignition and launch events. The agency concluded that the Starship launch and subsequent damage to the pad infrastructure in April had no long-term negative effects on the surrounding ecology. They added that water released from the deluge system is not expected to change the salinity of the existing mudflats or reduce or modify the piping plover or red knot habitat surrounding the launch site. The report noted that the water deluge tanks have a capacity of 358,000 gallons and launches are expected to use only 132,000 gallons or about 500,000 liters of water. So, it is possible the system could be used twice without recharging. Moreover, out of those 500,000 liters of water released, 92%, or nearly 460,000 liters, would be vaporized during engine ignition. The report says that the deluge system would be limited to 30 uses annually, including booster static fire tests and launches. The report also mentioned that a launch is expected to ablate up to 190 pounds or 86 kilograms of steel from the water discharge plate. Along with the environmental investigation performed by the Fish and Wildlife Service, the FAA also researched the safety aspect of Starship's launch procedures. The agency determined SpaceX met all safety, environmental, policy and financial responsibility requirements. The completion of the FAA and FWS investigations paved the way for the Starship's permit to fly for a second time. SpaceX received the modified Starship launch license from the FAA on Wednesday, which, similar to the first launch license, only covered a single integrated flight test. After the license was received, SpaceX stacked Ship 25 atop Booster 9 and began the final round of preparation for launch on November 17. However, on November 16, Elon Musk posted on X that the launch had been delayed by 24 hours as SpaceX would need to replace a grid fin actuator on the booster. Actuators are electric motors that control the grid fins to steer the super-heavy booster during landing. To replace the faulty actuator, teams de-stacked the ship and later removed the hot stage ring from the top of the booster. Although Musk indicated that a single actuator needed to be replaced, teams ended up replacing three of the four actuators. It is possible that issues were discovered later on with the other two actuators. After the actuators were replaced, the grid fins were tested to make sure they were performing as expected. After the works were complete, the hot stage ring was reinstalled, and later, the ship was restacked atop the booster for launch. The 24-hour delay caused by the actuator issue gave SpaceX a little more time to finish all the preparations needed for launch day. On the launch day, two hours before the liftoff, flight director conducted a go-no-go pole and gave commands for propellant loading. It took nearly an hour and a half to fully load the ship and the booster with 4,600 tons of liquid oxygen and methane propellant. The Raptor engine chill-down procedure began at the T-19 minutes and 40 seconds mark. During that phase, a portion of the propellant was passed through the engines of the booster in the ship to condition them to the right temperature before ignition. The vehicle then went into internal power, and the onboard computer took over the countdown sequence. At T-10 seconds, the flame deflector began flowing water under the launch mount. The Raptor startup sequence began at the T-3 second mark, followed by engine ignition. When the engines reached the required thrust level, the launch mount clamps were released, sending the 121-meter-tall rocket into space with a mighty roar. It was a spectacular and surreal sight. Starship kept climbing, and unlike the first flight test, none of the booster engines failed during liftoff and descent. The rocket surpassed the speed of sound and experienced maximum aerodynamic pressure 68 seconds after liftoff. The launch vehicle endured the harshest structural loads of its ascent into space during Max-Q. Two minutes and 43 seconds after liftoff, all of the booster engines except the inner three cut off as planned. Five seconds later, Starship ignited all six engines and smoothly separated from the booster stage. It was the first time SpaceX had ever attempted the hot staging technique. After a quick flip maneuver, the booster reignited its inner engines for boost backburn. However, three of the inner engines failed to reignite, and one of the engines shut down unexpectedly. 
Later, all of the engines rapidly shut down, and the booster exploded over the Gulf of Mexico. The flight termination system might have been triggered as SpaceX determined that the booster could not be returned safely due to multiple engine failures. Meanwhile, Ship 25 continued burning its engines for more than six minutes and attained an altitude of 150 kilometers. The ship's engines shut down as planned eight minutes after liftoff, however, shortly after, SpaceX lost the telemetry data from the spacecraft. During the post-flight discussion, SpaceX engineer John Insperger explained that they lost contact with the vehicle at the end of the second stage engine burn, and the automated flight termination system was triggered to prevent the vehicle from veering off course, bringing an early end to the test flight. A video surfaced on the internet a few hours after the launch, claiming to be Ship 25 re-entering the Earth's atmosphere over Puerto Rico. The authenticity of the video has not yet been verified. If all had gone according to plan, Starship would have continued accelerating towards space, completed nearly one full lap of the Earth, and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean near Hawaii. The flight made significant progress compared to the first test flight in April. Many of the Super Heavy's engines abruptly shut down during the first integrated flight test, causing the rocket to spin out of control. SpaceX was forced to activate the rocket's self-destruct mechanism, blowing up the rocket over the Gulf of Mexico. Flight 2 was successful in many aspects compared to Flight 1. There were no in-flight booster engine failures, and stage separation and second stage engine ignition went as per the plan. The success can be attributed to upgrades such as the new hot stage separation system and the Raptor electric thrust vector control system. The water deluge system also appeared to have performed flawlessly, as no big rocks or concrete debris were seen flying off the launch pad during engine ignition and liftoff. The launch pad looked fine compared to its condition after the April launch. Little to no damage was done to the launch pad and the deluge system steel plates. The Starship's quick disconnect arm, meanwhile, sustained some minor damage that should hopefully be fixed soon. The water storage tank at the tank farm also incurred some damage, which might have resulted from debris impact. Despite ending earlier than expected, the mission gave SpaceX engineers valuable data that would enable them to make the necessary modifications and upgrades to the launch vehicle before the third attempt. Following the launch, the FAA issued a statement stating that there had been no reports of injuries or damage to public property and that they would oversee a mishap investigation into the flight. Once the investigation is complete, the FAA will give SpaceX corrective actions to complete before the company can receive a license for future Starship launches. The prototypes for the third flight are slated to be Starship 28 and Super Heavy Booster 10, both of which have several upgrades over the current vehicles. Static fire testing of Ship 28 and Booster 10 to prepare them for the launch will begin in the near future. A new ship was fully stacked at the Starbase production site lately. The aft section of Starship 32 was moved inside the high bay on Thursday, October 16. Later, it was joined with the already stacked sections, completing the basic structure of Ship 32. Next, teams will install the aft flaps and connect all wiring and plumbing to prepare the ship for cryo-proof tests at Massey's. Several metal pieces that resemble the columns and beams of the Starship launch tower have arrived at Starbase lately. Plans to build a second launch tower at the Starbase have been in the works for the past three years. Several launch tower sections are already prefabricated at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility at Kennedy Space Center. Perhaps SpaceX plans to ship the completed section from Roberts Road and build the remaining tower sections at Starbase. The new tower will be near the existing launch tower per the Starbase launch site expansion plan released in 2020. SpaceX is also building a Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. The basic structure of the tower has already been completed. There has been no significant progress in the tower and launch pad works for the past several months. A second launch tower at Starbase and the launch tower at Kennedy will increase the cadence of Starship launches, helping to speed up Musk's goal of colonizing Mars. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. SpaceX launched the Transporter 9 rideshare mission from Vandenberg Space Force Base on Saturday, November 11. The mission, the ninth in a series of SpaceX's dedicated small sat rideshare missions, carried 90 payloads for a variety of customers. After stage separation, the Falcon 9's first stage returned to Earth for a vertical touchdown at Vandenberg about seven and a half minutes after liftoff. It was the 12th launch and landing for this particular booster. Deployment of payloads from the second stage to a 520-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit began almost an hour after launch and lasted for about 30 minutes. The payloads range from Pico satellites of less than a kilogram to satellites weighing several hundred kilograms. The customer with the most payloads on Transporter 9 was Planet. The company had 36 of its Dove Imaging CubeSats on the launch. 
Doves are about the size of a shoebox and weigh approximately 5 kilograms. The satellites provide 3-meter multispectral image resolution for various mapping applications, such as tracking urbanization and deforestation, improving natural disaster relief efforts, and raising agricultural yields worldwide. While some rideshare customers deal directly with SpaceX to launch their spacecraft, most of the payloads are handled by launch integrators. These companies purchase space on the payload stack, group customer payloads into that space, and launch either directly from the rocket's second stage or on board a separable deployer or space tug that will release payloads at a later time. Please check out the link in the description for the complete list of all the 90 satellites launched on the Transporter 9 mission. The day after the Transporter 9 mission, on Sunday, November 12, SpaceX launched a pair of Internet satellites for Luxembourg-based company, SES, from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The launch vehicle carried the third pair of O3BM power satellites into a medium Earth orbit. After stage separation, the Falcon 9's first stage came back to Earth and made a vertical touchdown on a drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the ninth launch and landing for this particular booster. Two hours after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage deployed the two Boeing-built satellites into an 8,000-kilometer orbit. O3B stands for other 3 billion, referring to the billions of people worldwide without access to consistent and reliable internet service. The more powerful O3BM power satellites are designed to expand the existing O3B constellation of communication satellites, operated by SES, providing low-latency broadband connectivity to remote locations. The first two O3BM power satellites were launched in December 2022, followed by the second pair in April this year. Once all six satellites in orbit are operational, they are expected to provide high-speed connectivity to various customers in government and private industries as early as 2024. The launch of the next pair of O3BM power satellites is targeting the second half of 2024. Once complete, the M-Power constellation will comprise 13 high-throughput and low-latency satellites, compared to the 20 in the original O3B constellation. The European Space Agency has released the first full-color images from Euclid, the agency's latest space telescope. The Euclid Space Telescope was launched aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on July 1. After being deployed from the rocket's upper stage, the Space Observatory began its one-month-long journey to a halo orbit around the second Sun-Earth Lagrange point at an average distance of 1.5 million kilometers beyond Earth's orbit. It is the exact location where NASA's James Webb Space Telescope operates. Euclid is a visible to near-infrared space telescope designed primarily to better understand dark energy and dark matter by accurately measuring the acceleration of the universe. In addition, Euclid will also perform near-infrared spectroscopy of hundreds of millions of galaxies and stars, allowing scientists to investigate their chemical and kinematic properties in detail. Following three months of checkouts and calibration, Euclid began its science mission in October. Euclid's team revealed the telescope's first five color images during a video broadcast on November 7. This incredible snapshot from Euclid shows 1,000 galaxies belonging to the Perseus Cluster, located 240 million light-years away from Earth, and more than 100,000 additional galaxies further out in the background. Many of these faint galaxies were previously unseen, and some are so far away that their light has taken 10 billion years to reach us. The next image released was of a spiral galaxy known as Caldwell 5, nicknamed the Hidden Galaxy, located 11 million light-years from Earth. This galaxy owes its nickname to the fact that it is obscured by the Milky Way from our perspective. Thanks to its infrared view, Euclid has already uncovered crucial information about the stars in this galaxy. The third image released was of an irregular dwarf galaxy called NGC 6822, located 1.6 million light-years from Earth. This sparkly image shows Euclid's view of a globular cluster called NGC 6397, located about 7800 light-years away. Globular clusters are collections of hundreds of thousands of stars held together by gravity. Currently, no other telescope than Euclid can observe an entire globular cluster in one single observation and at the same time distinguish so many stars in the cluster. In this image, Euclid shows us a spectacularly panoramic and detailed view of the Horsehead Nebula. At a distance to Earth of 1,375 light-years, this region in the constellation Orion is a stellar nursery where dust and gas accumulate into stars and planets. Euclid's images help astronomers find new stars, brown dwarfs, and planet-like objects in this cloud. These five images mark an important step in the Euclid Telescope's six-year mission to create the largest cosmic 3D map ever made. Firstly, they showcase that Euclid's telescope and instruments are performing extremely well. Secondly, each image individually contains a wealth of new information about the nearby universe. 
After some final fine-tuning of the telescope, Euclid will start routine observations in early 2024. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.